One of the things that I really appreciate about all the Bharatiya Vidyas is the emphasis on guna. And I think that this is, matra, you know, is important, that means quantity, but guna, which means quality, is even more important. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archived teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Sabota's business collaborator who helped him to create his online business. This week, we have a conversation between Dr. Sabota and Dr. Ram Kumar Kuti, who is one of the visionaries behind Vitagrama Healing Village, which is an Ayurvedic eco-village in South India. Dr. Ram Kumar and Dr. Saboda have been longtime friends and colleagues for many decades. And this conversation drops us into kind of an ongoing conversation that they've been having for a long time about the state of Ayurveda, what has worked in the past, and what we can create now that merges those two. So I think you'll find this conversation really enlightening. If you'd like to study with Dr. Svoboda, he has a number of courses on different topics in Ayurveda, including Ayurveda and the microbiome, a course on Rasa and Ojas. You can check those out at drsvoboda.teachable.com. That's drsvoboda.teachable.com under courses, and you'll see all of the available courses there. We hope you enjoy this episode. I'm here today with Dr. Ram Kumar, and we're going to be talking about a project of his that has been going on for several years now, Vaidigrama Ayurvedic Healing Village. Um, Dr. Ram Kumarji, if you would start off, please, by talking a little bit about how you and I met I mean, we originally met in 1984, very, very briefly, but thereafter, when we started to um, interact more substantively, and and what interested you about this whole Vedigrama project to begin with? Namaste, Robert G. Um, I think uh, we we started interacting more closely in the year 1999 or 2000 when we were both speakers at a conference in New York organized by the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. Uh, I was a substitute speaker for my oh. late uncle Krishna Kumarji, ah. uh, who was indisposed and so... I came and uh, we began talking there. Uh, You remembered your visit to the Ayurveda College in Coimbatore in 1984, which was the year that I had joined as a young student uh, in the college. And then we we started talking and... uh, Thereafter, I believe we have met every single year. I believe so. Except? During the pandemic. Except even the pandemic, you were here, weren't you? You were here in 2020, January. Yes. And 2021 also you were here. So yes, I guess that was every year. Yes, yes. yes. We have been meeting for 22 or 23 years now. (laughs) And uh, the second part of your question is about the project, I think. Well, I mean, 
I think it's fair to say that both both you and I, I mean, certainly from different perspectives, because you studied down here and I studied in Maharashtra, but both of us feel that, I mean, I hate to say that there is, well, there's something missing from Ayurveda as it's being taught in practice today. And, um, and that certainly has been something we've talked about. And I think that um, probably it would be helpful if you spoke a little bit about what it was that you personally think Ayurveda needs to have added to it or changed or removed from it to make it to make it come closer to what it to, uh, to 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 being what it really has been and what it can be in the future. Yes, I, we've had many interesting conversations about the way Ayurveda was studied and practiced in the eighties and nineties, and um, I think my personal view then was that. Um, we as a community have not been very clear about whether we should study Ayurveda in its purest form or whether we should integrate um, aspects from other systems of medicine and um, thereby create some level of confusion in the mind of the young student. And I think the way the official Ayurveda study program evolved over a period of time, um, it has been a mix of ideas and principles from both the Ayurveda thought process and the Western medicine thought process. And the practice also changed accordingly, where Ayurveda became a more clinic-based, formal, uh, diagnostic, and prescriptive medicine rather than the Vaidya and the patient spending a lot more time with each other, um, getting into the heart of the patient and, and you know, incorporating all the aspects of not just Yukti Vipashriya, but also the Deva Vipashraya and Sattva Vajaya Chigilsa, the, uh, you know, where we work with the mind and with karma. Those aspects were starting to be removed from the Ayurveda treatment or um, practice. And further, while we kept calling Ayurveda holistic, It, it, it was starting to follow the reductionist framework that most modern medical systems were moving into. I think we have had some conversations along these different lines and wondered why both the study and the practice of Ayurveda could not be a little closer to what the um, texts have spoken about and why can't the Ayurveda community have the confidence um, in our own ability to, to work with the larger global community. Yes, and, and this is very much, very much exactly the same sort of thing articulated in a different way that I've been, that I started to experience when I joined the Ayurvedic College in Pune in 1974. It was the same ongoing debate, possibly even more um, highly influenced by modern medicine uh, there at that time. Um, and, and the fact that, that it, was, it, it, it was a very complicated situation, but people seemed, there, was, uh, there, there were a number of, of, of well-educated Ayurvedists who who genuinely felt that that Ayurveda should somehow become 
subsumed into modern medicine when in fact I felt and continue to feel exactly the opposite way that modern medicine, the techniques are very useful, but the the theory and the really and the and the and the 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 drishti, the perspective, the worldview of modern medicine is really has has very little to offer someone who really wants to be truly healthy. And um, so, and uh, hence Vedugrama, I suppose. But when did you first get the idea of, of creating? I mean, this is a big project, so. So, so if you may remember, even before Vedugrama, we did the conference in Mahabalipuram. Yes. Where science meets consciousness, we, I think, together we decided on this name. Yeah. Because there was this tendency for the Ayurveda community to, uh, to take Atma out um, and say that we are pure science. Yeah. And, and so um, that was a conference which was attended by more than 500, 600 young students and Vaidyas from all over the country, and you were there, and uh, Deepak Chopra ji yes. was there, and Claudia ji was there. That is where we met. I met Claudia ji for the first time. And uh, yes, uh, so I think all of this started sowing the seeds. That was 2008? 2006. 2006. And then we did two more in 2008 right. and 2011. In 2011. Uh, but it started sowing the seeds of whether we can actually create a space where we can um, be as close to the text as possible and apply Ayurveda in, in its entirety, you know, not just as treatments and medicines, but also in terms of looking after the environment, looking after the community. Um, bringing in aspects of Vastu and Jyotish and, you know, at some point, Kala, now we are slowly moving into yes, Kala, into, becoming into a more Kala integral well. part, growing our own food, growing our own herbs. So I think the seed started sometime then. So if you were going to, if you were going to describe Vaidhigrama as it has evolved to this point, Describe it and its values. Is there a, a fairly concise kind of way you could present that? So uh, I think uh, uh, one line that we keep remembering for ourselves uh, is creating a sustainable healing community centered on the principles of Ayurveda and natural farming. And when we say Ayurveda, we are including Bharatiya Shastras. Yes. Uh, so this is how we, we kept reminding ourselves, this is what we want to do, a sustainable, a self-sustainable healing community using the principles of the Bharatiya Shastras and natural farming. And of course, as many people around the world are finding out, the, what, what sustainable is, is, is something that is evolving. And what does it really mean to be really sustainable? But I, I mean, one of the things that has always interested me in Vaidhigrama is that it is the place where experimentation is going on. Uh, and and, and that, is, uh, that is very much a part of Ayurvedic tradition, as it is of modern medicine, no doubt, as well. But Ayurveda's perspective on how to experiment with things is different from the, uh, that's one of the ways that modern medicine, I, for me, and Ayurveda are different. I mean, one way is, of course, that modern medicine is based in materialistic, mechanistic, atheistic science, and Ayurveda is very much based in the concept that Everything has evolved from consciousness. Everything is conscious. And at least there should be an appreciation for that consciousness. And, and so this is, of course, a, a, a very substantial difference between the two. And, uh, 
And, and it is, uh, I, as I think you would agree, a, uh, a work in progress. Always. We continue to make mistakes. We continue to learn from the mistakes. And when we don't learn from the mistakes, we are forced to yes. learn from the mistakes. Yes. That is the beauty of reality. It will force <laughs> you to cooperate whether you want to or not. Um, so as, as, as you proceeded ahead with this project and if, as things has, have, as, as it has developed and it has, it has grown and um, in the context of, of Ayurveda as a whole, in the, in the environment, particularly in the environment that you're in here in South India, have you seen changes in the way that, uh, let's leave Vedagrama aside for the moment, but the way that other, other Vaidyas, other Ayurvedists are practicing or the way that other, the, the teachers and students think about Ayurveda? And if so, what kind of changes have you seen? Uh I definitely think that in the last decade or so, there is a resurgence in the way Ayurveda is being studied and practiced, primarily in this part of India, but also across the rest of India. We are seeing a lot more Vaidyas who are, who are rooted in the Shastras, who are very confident speaking about the Shastras. Uh, we are seeing young Vaidyas who are, uh, you know, specializing in certain areas of healing. Um, specializing might be a wrong word, but they are more focused on, like, for example, on the on Shara Sutra for um, anorectal issues, or there are a lot of very good young lady Vaidyas who are working extensively with women's health issues. Um, there are uh, Vaidyas working with the eye. You know, I think you are familiar with this recent, um, you know, the, was it the African, former African president's daughter or somebody who went to Sridhar EM Ayurveda Hospital in Kerala and got treated and recovered completely uh, uh, using Ayurveda treatment, and that has received a lot of global attention. So on the practice front, there is, there is a surge in the uh, uh, number of patients coming for uh, a more varied uh, set of issues. If you remember in the 80s and 90s, we would primarily be seeing vata issues yes. or patients arthritis or and arthritis and, and patients in a, a senior citizen yes. category. But now we are seeing um, younger patients coming. We are seeing a lot more of pitta issues. So in Vaidyagrama itself, the, the nature of treatment has changed so much that there's, that there's a lot more pitta being addressed rather than vata being addressed right from the beginning. So definitely the practice, on the medical practice front, um, the community itself has uh, be, become a lot more confident and strong in, in application. And even in COVID times, the Ministry of Ayush Government of India uh, put out a lot of uh, suggestions. Many Ayurveda Vaidyas have been treating COVID patients. Uh, uh, well, if we ask for evidence based I don't think it has been generated the way the Western scientific community wants. But anecdotally, there are thousands and lakhs of Indian patients who have been treated with uh, Ayurveda. But I am still not sure that we are completing the, the, the circle when we say holistic. Holistic is a, is a very heavy word. Very heavy. And... Uh, if we choose to use the word holistic, we need to truly um, be holistic. Yeah. Uh, attempt to be holistic. <laughs> well, and, and uh, I mean, I, uh, it takes quite a long time for a tree to grow. So 
I at least have a certain degree of confidence that um, if in fact things are moving in a good direction, that there's a good potential for them to move and continue moving in a good direction, even though there may be, there are always, there are always obstructions, there are always are, are, are setbacks, but, but um, I, I'm glad to, uh, I'm glad to hear your perspective. I mean, I, I have, um, uh, I, I, I have seen in different parts of the country certainly greater, um, not only greater interest uh, on the part of the population in general, but as you were saying, greater interest in the ca- uh, patients who might have gone immediately to modern medicine before are re- preferring to go in a less uh, less uh, pharmaceutical and and initially kind of more interested in in attempting to heal their bodies in a more natural kind of way, which is um, which is of course what Ayurveda emphasizes. Ayurveda is not afraid of surgery or poison or any other kind of harsh treatment if it is required. But if if you can do something with uh, simply giving the patient hot water and a, a, a decoction of some kind, why do you want to do something that is going to create more douche parinama, more side effects? Absolutely. And, and it's not just within India. I think globally also, the awareness has increased considerably. Yes, oh, and, I would agree. And we for are sure. getting people coming for all kinds of health issues in very early stage of the health issue for treatment with Ayurveda. At Vaidigrama, we have received patients from more than 70 countries uh, oh. in the last 10 years or 12 years. And, and I, think, I think it's important to emphasize for our listeners that one of the challenges that I at least remember from 50 years ago when I first got involved in Ayurveda is that Almost always, people would come to Ayurveda when they had exhausted every other possibility, which means they had already taken a lot of <clears throat> modern medical uh, uh, interventions, and their bodies had been very much disturbed by those side effects and the surgical uh, operations. And, and, and then they came to Ayurveda hoping for some kind of miracle instead of recognizing that it would be better to start with doing things in a more uh, a, a more holistic, I, there I am using that word again, a more a more natural and a more real connected to nature kind of way, and then to dis- determine what aspects of of the organism might have become too vital, devitalized to to rejuvenate or revitalize and only then go to some more more intrusive and and detrimental kind of intervention. True. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, And it's interesting that today, as more and more people become aware of Ayurveda, uh, when they come for Ayurveda treatment, they want the more intense treatments from day one. Um, they, you know, people want panchakarma, since everybody has heard this word panchakarma. Uh, and if, and, and if, if my neighbor is getting panchakarma and I'm not getting panchakarma, then, then I, I'm missing out. Then I, then I'm going, then, then I, I am not able to keep up with the, with, with the potential for revitalization. Um, and, and certainly that is very much on people's minds. I, I read an article just yesterday about a young a, a man in his mid-30s who is spending $2 million a year on various kinds of interventions trying to make himself younger and younger and younger. And... Um, and, and you can, I'm sure, do a lot with $2 million, but perhaps you can also do a lot with simply eating right and exercising right and all of the things 
that we are finding again and again. I also read an article just this morning that was, uh, I, I had re- reread it, it originally came out in 2018, about how people from many countries uh, will come to the United States and they will be generally healthy, but they will have the microbiome from the countries they come in. And as soon as they get to the U.S. and start eating a standard U.S. fast food, highly fried with lots of sugar and salt diet, the microbiome changes and they become prey to all of the diseases that are characterized, characteristic of of modern civilization. So just changing your diet can have a dramatic effect But people, of course, would prefer to take a pill because it is much easier. And then they can continue enjoying themselves. And and instead, if they went to the United States and followed the principle of sandhi or transition and allowed this change to happen more gradually, where they don't overnight shift to a U.S. diet and lifestyle, but maybe do it over six months or one year or two years, perhaps the damage would be a lot less. One of the things that I really appreciate about all the Bharatiya Vidyas is the emphasis on guna. And I think that this is, matra, you know, is important. That means quantity. But guna, which means quality, is even more important. And the very fact that life has, is becoming faster and faster and more and more superficial, but, but, but longevity is not fast. And longevity is not superficial. And... People are trying to live as fast as they can and still, and still dream that they are going to be able to remain healthy indefinitely. And the reality intrudes on that dream and then they wake up and then their condition is not so good. And then many of them become obsessive about their health, which is also very destructive to that very health. Obsession is not, is, is, is not sustainable. And, and that is where I think when people tell us Ayurveda is too restrictive, I think Ayurveda is something to, that we should enjoy. It should make us light. The moment we say restrictive, it is making us heavy. It means we are becoming obsessive about it. And the same thing happens when people work with, you know, have organic food or exercise or asana practice. We can enjoy the process or we can become obsessive about it and thereby become very heavy and weighed down. I, I, I fear that there is something a bit um, infantilized about the concept of never having any restriction whatsoever. In the US, of course, the concept of freedom is bandied about by everybody. But there are certain things that we know will happen if you are not restrictive. If you do not clean your teeth regularly, your teeth are going to deteriorate. I can, I can testify to this. I have personal experience from being young and foolish. If, in fact, you take care of your teeth, then you can expect them to last for your entire lifetime, potentially. But that applies to every organ system. That applies to to all of the relationships you have with other people and with animals and with the places you stay and so on. If you don't acknowledge that there are going to be certain ways in which you're going to be restricted, Restriction is going to come. If you eat unrestrictedly, eventually you will be restricted by being unhealthy. So uh, restrictive, of course, is yes. It's kind of a word that people, it causes some coach. It causes constriction in the mind. But we could say proactive. That's even 
That's much better. That's much better. Then, then even discipline can start to taste better if it is proactive discipline, something positive we can do. Um, one other question that I would like to ask is, <clears throat> in the context of creating this place and its evolution up until now, what would you say has surprised you the most? Not to put you on the spot or anything, but I, I think the way the intention has been supported right from day one in different ways, um, sometimes from unknown quarters, um, and whenever we run into a block, one door closes, another door opens. It has been. You know, you are aware that we started with no funds. Yes. In fact, we started on the negative. Yes. And uh, still, you know, we started with two rooms. You were there. Yes. And then two patients yes. came in. Yes. And then we had four rooms and four patients. And so it, it, it grew very organically um, with minimal interruption for the first six years till we reached the completion of the first phase of 36 rooms. And on every occasion, support came in from some quarter. Uh, you know, the, the way some of the land was bought, you, you know, there's so many stories, as you're aware, of how somebody comes in and says, take this money and, you know, you can return it whenever you want. and um, I think I think it reinforced uh, my conviction in the idea that if the intention is strong and pure, uh, it will get supported despite the numerous obstacles on the way. And if something didn't work out, it meant we had to revisit the that part of the intention. Mm. So, so, so the learning was um, really good along the way. And, and it also surprised us how we actually, you know, kept ha having to expand the meaning of the word authentic. You know, we said we want to practice authentic Ayurveda, little realizing that this word can be expanded in so many different directions. The construction has to be natural. Everything should be as local as possible. Um, uh, we should grow our own food, we should recycle, reuse, restore. And then we suddenly realized if we don't take care of the surrounding community, uh, we will not be able to create a healing environment within. So this world is still expanding for all of us. And I think that's a great learning and a great surprise also for every one of us. <laughs> my, my general experience of life has been that when, when something has real potential and when it's being supported by nature or providence or whatever you want to call it, that this sort of thing will happen, that it will get support. And often, of course, that support will happen at the last minute instead of at the first minute. But I think that it's a, 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 a good thing that that support is, is coming and it is definitely my hope that it will Continued, and huh? sometimes the support is well past the last minute, and there again we realize we have set that barrier for ourselves. <laughs> well, thank you very much for for uh, conversing with me today. It's part of our own ongoing conversation since now seventeen years, and God willing, we will continue for the next many years into the future. Om. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>